Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for being here today. My name is Dylan Fraser. I'm a professor in the Department of Biology at Concordia University in Montreal. And I'm here to talk to you about population monitoring of fishes based on fish size, the age structure of fish populations, and catch data. Now, I come from a background of studying fish biology and ecology in a number of different geographic areas, predominantly in Canada, uh, but also in the US and in parts of Europe. And a lot of the kinds of research that I conduct on wild fish populations has focused on applications of science for local based fisheries management and community based conservation. So for the past 20 plus years now, I've collaborated with the Cree Nation of Mysticity and Niskamoon Corporation on a series of long term monitoring projects of fish populations within the Mistassini Lake area. And most recently, uh, we are now expanding a lot of the different kinds of research and monitoring that we do within Iwishi through the Fishes Project that is fostering indigenous small scale fisheries for health, economy and food security. Uh, it's very exciting to be working along with uh, EMR with, uh, throughout the James Bay Coast uh, to help them develop and think about strategies for monitoring fish populations that are important to the Cree in those areas as well. Now today I'm going to highlight a few different kind of key core concepts that fish biologists consider when thinking about how to best monitor fish overall. One of them relates to just a better understanding of what a population is. Uh, then I'll talk about fish size and specifically how size structure and age structure can be relevant for monitoring fish populations, as well as collecting basic data on the catchability of fish. And throughout, we'll consider these concepts in relation to their relevance for monitoring fish populations. And finally, I'll leave off with a few slides about standardized sampling and a, a couple of the key things to measure and quantify and record in a systematic or, or similar way through time to facilitate uh, the generation of very useful practical data for fish monitoring. Okay, so <clears throat> scientists like to think about uh, fish in relation to what they're doing on the land in different areas based on what we refer to as populations. And scientists define these as groups of individuals, the same species, that are living and interbreeding within a given area. And one of the things that's really great about fish is that they often return to the same area that they were born when they ultimately mature as adults and reproduce themselves. And we call this in scientific terms, natal phylopatry. And what this phylopatry does is it allows us to uh, quantify or, or look at fish populations in a very discreet way. Often fish, <clears throat> for example, move between breeding areas and feeding areas that may be uh, where they undertake migrations to a lake or along the James Bay coast to obtain growth and a larger body size. And fish will commonly then return back to the river of origin to breed uh, where they will spawn and their juveniles will be reared for one to uh, potentially a few different years before they themselves complete the life cycle and return back to the ocean, obtain a large body size and then re reproduce themselves. This kind of natal phylopatry and the succession over multiple generations of individuals coming back and reproducing in the same place where they were born and where their parents reproduced means that over time, fish develop these very discrete and uh, highly distinct populations uh, in relation to local environmental conditions that are found there. So you can have individual populations that are optimized for having fast growth, larger body sizes, others have might have different coloration or different behavior. And this discreteness of fish populations allows us to spatially monitor them for management purposes in a much easier way because we can kind of demarcate where each of these populations is found, uh, the scale at which they use they, in terms of their movements, and thus we can focus in on a given population and assess how that population is doing in relation to environmental changes that might be taking place in different geographic areas or in relation to new human activities or the extent of harvesting. So just as an example of distinct populations that can occur within the lakes or the coastal areas you know, within Iwishi, this is an example of just different brook trout populations found within Mastassini Lake. There are a couple of breeding populations found in the Northeast tributaries where these fish spawn. There's also a population that spawns within the outflow they're very distinct in terms of their coloration, their body size and the body shape. 
and the timing at which they have spawning in each of these geographic areas. And the migrations that they undertake within the lake are also different in a spatial context. So different areas will have more or less of each of these population groups. So as you can see here, the tributary fish are predominantly found on the east side of the lake, so to speak, and the outflow fish are predominantly found on the west side. And so for management, this is really important because if there are changes in local environmental conditions in one of these geographic areas, we know the scale at which each of these discrete populations is found at. And so we can act accordingly to try to protect one of these populations or all of them uh, in relation to the kinds of changes that are taking place. Now, fish size structure is something that is quite basic, but very important for scientists to quantify and measure and look at whether we're looking at a fish population through time and seeing how it might be changing or to, to what degree it's stable, or whether we're looking at different fish populations. So at the top right here, this is just a figure that shows the relationship between the age of a fish and its overall length or its body size. And fish have indeterminate growth. So they actually keep growing throughout their lives, which is different from you and me, but fish grow more rapidly when they're younger and then that growth tapers off. Now each of these growth curves, these lines represents fish from different populations. So although there is a commonality to show that fish increase their overall size with age, it takes uh, individuals from different populations a very variable amount of time to reach that same body size. You can have a lot of population variation in the overall growth of fish and how long fish can live. And it often takes a long time for fish to reach a, the, the point at which they are ready to reproduce. And this is something that we value as scientists because reproduction is obviously a, a really important event and allows new individuals to be recruited in the population uh, to help uh, replace adults as they get too old and pass away, or if they're harvested by humans, or if there's environmental changes that might lead to uh, increased mortality. Now, this bottom right here panel just shows you that a, a kind of a general distribution of the sizes that we normally see within fish populations. So uh, quite commonly, there are a lot more smaller fish relative to a, a very shallow, long tail, extended tail of very big fish. So there's not nearly as many big fish within populations as they're all small ones. This is very normal. And it's really good to recognize that fish populations are characterized by having a very varying number of small and larger individuals and that all of these different sizes of fish are really important for contributing to reproduction and survival of each population. So larger fish commonly produce more and larger eggs. Uh, and they often spawn over longer time periods, uh, whether the fish is a species that spawns in the summer or the fall. Whereas small fish and large fish themselves will spawn at different times over the breeding season. And so they each contribute in their own way to the resilience of populations when there's environmental changes. You always will ensure that some fish are going to reproduce and be successful at creating offspring for the next generation if you have fish spawning at different times. And if you protect larger fish that are rarer uh, and disproportionate, that's important because disproportionately they contribute to the overall recruitment of fish populations in terms of the new young fish that come in or are born in a given year. So <clears throat> we like to characterize then as scientists, fish size in relation to the growth of the fish, their body condition, and their overall age to understand this, because this can help us forecast how well fish populations will do in a future context, how many reproductive adults we will have in a population, uh, what, we can, what we can expect in terms of the new babies that will be produced from the adults that are spawning in a given year. And just to highlight that you could have real dramatic differences even within the same geographic area amongst populations of the same species. This highlights four different forms of lake trout that have varying growth within Mistassini Lake itself. And the growth relates to environmental conditions found within the lake. So some of these forms are found more in shallow areas. There's also a form that's found very, very deep, 100 to 200 meters down. This form here in the bottom depths of Mistassini Lake doesn't obtain a very large body size, as highlighted by these circles here uh, found within purple. There aren't many nutrients and there's not much food availability at the bottom of the lake. <clears throat> and so a lake trout can't grow very large here. But in the middle of Mistassini Lake, at the mid-depths, 
there's a lot of different forage fish, other types of fish that the lake trout can prey on. And so they get to be very, very large uh, at these depths. And as you can see, they can obtain sizes of over 10 kilograms and, and even more than that. Uh, but their growth is very different uh, relative to other forms, especially when compared to the form that's found at the bottom of the lake. And so you can have a situation even in Mistassini Lake where you have fish that are very different in their overall sizes, but they can actually dramatically differ as well in their age. So it's important to recognize age structure within populations because the population at the bottom here that is very small, its environmental conditions are very different than the population at the top here where pop, the fish can get very large. Now, of course, it still does take a long time for these fish to grow to such a large body size. And that's another important point to factor in when we think about harvesting or protecting fish populations because those big fish are so important for the resilience of populations, but they also take a long time to grow and, and reach that size. It's also important to recognize that there can be differences between males and females within populations in terms of their size and age characteristics to prevent um, undesirable effects from, for example, harvesting too much of one sex or the other. So a good example of this comes from walleye. Commonly, walleye exhibit size dimorphism, wherein females are larger than males. And this is exemplified here by this population uh, of walleye found within Mistassini Lake, the Takwa River. This is a tributary within the lake. And as you can see, it's been sampled at least on three different occasions over the last 20 years or so, in 2002, in 2015, and 2017. And consistently through time, we see that males are smaller than females. So this is relevant for considering from the standpoint of monitoring fish populations, but also for harvest management, it would certainly uh, be undesirable to only harvest the largest fish within these particular populations. If fishers just kept big fish, they might be predominantly targeting only females, which would of course not be an ideal uh, situation in terms of how the recruitment and the success of producing new offspring would be for uh, the, this particular walleye population. Now, if you go and you measure fish in a standardized way uh, through time and you quantify their size structure, you can generate really relevant baseline data and information that <laughs> allows you to always have comparisons with the past in a, in a standardized way. And this can really reflect or, or changes in the body size can really be a, a useful indicator that there may be changes in the environment that may, may be leading to a reduction or an increase in the body size. Hopefully it's, it's not a reduction. Um, or it can relate to uh, over harvesting or other climate induced changes. So as one example here again, in Mistassini Lake walleye, there are several populations of walleye that breed within the rivers close to the south where the community of Mistassini is found, where all the tourists come up every year to do their fishing. Um, and <clears throat> if you look at their size characteristics over time, relative to a lightly fished population found at the far northern part of the lake, which is much more isolated and difficult to access, you see a consistent trend in both sexes, the males and females, for a decline uh, since about the year 2002 to 2003. In all of the three populations that are found within the South, the Perch, the Icon, and the Charlefour Rivers, whereas body size through time was stable within the Taco River, the area where uh, not as much fishing takes place. It doesn't necessarily prove that fishing is the cause of the reduction in body size here, but given the information that was provided to us at the same time that this scientific data was collected by Cree fishers and their concerns over their observations of a reduction in body size in these rivers in the south, as well as it becoming more difficult to catch walleye um, <clears throat> or the same numbers of walleye in the same amount of time, they had to put more effort into catching them. Uh, everything kind of complemented each other in painting a picture or at least presenting some concern that uh, potentially over harvesting or, or was one of the, the major reasons for the reduction in the body size through time in these populations. And so in this particular case, this, this kind of information has been really useful for the Cree Nation of Mysticine. They have their own monitoring program of walleye now, and they've established some uh, conservation recommendations for the community in terms of how to proceed with protecting the walleye in these different spawning rivers near the community. Okay, another aspect that can be relevant from the standpoint of monitoring fish populations relates to obtaining standardized catch data. So if you can measure in a standardized way 
uh, <clears throat> the rate at which fish are captured with certain kinds of gear, sampling gear, that could be gill nets, um, or it could be something like uh, rod and reel. And you can measure the time it takes to catch so many fish per day or per 24 hour period of setting nets. If you do this through time, you have a, a comparable way to look at potentially how many fish, at least it's an indirect way of getting an assessment of whether fish populations are increasing their numbers or decreasing through time, or whether there are geographic areas where more of that species is present than others. So as an example of a spatial comparison, this panel here in the top right just shows you the number of lake trout that were caught in these same gill nets that were set throughout the lake for Albanel, Mastafsini, and Wakanichi over a 24-hour period. And you can see that Wakanichi has a much larger number of, uh, in terms of an average number of lake trout that are caught per net um, relative to the other two lakes here. So this can be really useful to understand abundance, relative abundance of fish across different geographic areas. But you can also, of course, do this through time. And this just reflects the number of fish that were caught for every uh, eight hour fishing day within a series of tributaries uh, that are important spawning rivers for brook trout between a, an archival period from 2000 versus a more contemporary period from 2016. And here we see that the average body size, uh, sorry, the, uh, the average number of fish that were caught for an eight hour fishing day is actually very, very similar across uh, the two time periods within these three different populations. So this can also be really useful data for uh, fisheries management. Now, last couple of slides, I just wanna discuss a few key items relating to data collection for fish population monitoring. If one was going to undertake these kinds of research studies. Uh, <clears throat> first, we would recommend that you would go in ideally annually, but at least every few years into these different fish populations, whether they're in rivers, and, uh, whether they're moving along towards their spawning grounds, whether they're found within tributaries at certain times of the year, or potentially specific spatial areas along the James Bay coast. And in, in, as you do this monitoring, the idea would be to target a minimum or capture a minimum of 50 individuals per sex and per species to generate a distribution of the lengths and mass of the fish to, to capture the overall size structure of the population. And preferably you would go out and whether you're doing something like standardized gill netting or, or angling, this would be carried out over a period of successive days, but ideally even for a longer period of time over multiple weeks to really capture the essence of what that fish population is all about. On a number of these different fish that were caught, um, if a number of them were harvested, you could also take advantage and collect the otolith bones from each of these fish. And if they were preserved and stored, they can be left for some time up until some future time point in which uh, the aging of the fish could take place. So we can characterize the age structure of populations. And other important data to record include the fishing effort in terms of how much time nets were set to capture fish or how much time was spent with a rod and reel to catch the fish, uh, as well as the type of method for capturing the fish, and of course the dates that fish were recorded. Provided that all of these different kinds of information are recorded, this uh, means you're well on your way to beginning a fish monitoring program in your geographic area. And of course, different types of information or, or data collection could be incorporated into it in subsequent years. Regarding otoliths, the otolith collection itself can be a bit tedious. It, it requires going in, opening up the brain case of the animal and extracting these small ear bones called the otoliths, which look like these small little like comb-like features in the top right-hand corner here, just below my name. I've listed a couple of different example videos that go step by step in terms of how to extract these bones from a fish. If otoliths are preserved in a preserving liquid such as 95% ethanol, they can be left for multiple years before somebody cracks them open and looks at the annuli, the rings laid down in them, which are used to measure the age of the fish. Not unlike uh, people who study trees, when you cut a tree down and you see the rings that the tree forms in each growing season, it leaves that ring each, each, each growing or yearly season of growth. Um, we look at the same thing within these ear bones of the fish and it tells us the same story about how old the fish is. So that can be a really useful information 
and relevant to collect these uh, through time and assess age structure. And with that, I'm happy to entertain any questions you may have. I really appreciate your time for watching this video today. If you have any other additional questions and you would like to contact me, please, please feel free to reach me at this email address or my telephone number at Concordia University. Thank you very much and have a great day.